Hey, Bart. Hey, Court. I am really excited to talk with our old friend Sherry Soltis today from Service Dogs yeah, Inc. That's really cool. I'm excited to find out. Like, I've known her for a long time, and um, but she's done so much that, yeah. that I don't know about. Yeah. I mean, we've known her for, gosh, 25, tw tw at least 20 years. Yeah. Um, we've kind of grown our businesses together, except she's in the nonprofit world and we're in the for-profit world, but we've done a lot of great work for dogs uh, yep. in the Austin area. And so I'm really excited to talk with Me her too. today. Me too. I, I think it'll be good. So let's get to it. Let's do it. All right. Welcome, Sherry. Oh, good morning, both of you. We Hi. are so happy to have you today. I was just thinking oh. how... How many years has, uh, well, let me just start out, but why don't you tell us a little bit about what Service Dogs Inc. does and um, just anything that you want to tell us about it. We are like the cousins to a guide dog school. We train dogs that help people uh, who have a significant loss of hearing, hearing dogs touch them to get their attention and then lead them to sounds like the door knock or the baby crying or your cell phone. And we train service dogs to assist people with mobility related physical challenges like a spinal cord injury. They do a lot of picking up things people drop, things based on tug like opening doors, tugging off your socks, tugging off a jacket, opening the refrigerator and fetching you a non-alcoholic beverage. <laughs> uh, they do uh, things that are kind of like when you shake hands with a dog, which is targeting, they can push a button for an automatic door opener for a commercial door, like in a mall, they can close cabinets and doors. And we've trained each dog to uh, do additional custom behaviors, depending on what that client wants, like a deaf mom alerting her to the baby's cry or mm -hmm. one gentleman who was a Vietnam vet that was hurt in a helicopter accident. He was a medic and they landed on a minefield. Oh, he wow. has Velcro tennis shoes and he wanted the dog to tug off the Velcro straps. That's so right. we uh, don't consider ourselves like a Walmart of service dogs. They're not in an assembly line. It's more like a boutique or an artisan bakery. And in the last few years, we've added two more programs that are different types of facility dogs, where instead of partnering with an individual, they're serving a whole facility. One is the courthouse facility dogs. Oh, wow. And they partner with somebody in the district attorney's office who's like a victim's uh specialist and for children who have to testify and have, be interviewed about difficult topics the dog is there to help them find their oh, voice I and we've that. also started emergency services facility dogs which are even more relevant because of covid they support frontline workers and first responders who face a lot of stress on the job whether it's a paramedic or an er nurse mm -hmm. and the dogs help them get a healthy restart from all the stress that they undergo. One of the paramedics who, he's an EMS relations manager who handles the, one of our, the dogs we train said, you have 10 feet to reset yourself from one patient to the next one. Oh, and wow. make that new patient your center of attention, even though something really bad might've happened to the first one. And he also said, whether it's on the side of the road or at the ER, we meet you on the worst day of your life. So those folks, similar to veterans have a lot of stress and sometimes the outlet is self-destructive behavior. So the dogs really give them a way to get a very healthy emotional reset and help them kind of dry their tears and go on to the next patient. Just, just wow. like through like petting or just interacting with the dog or is the dog it's snuggling? It's petting and or? interacting. Um, we have the dogs do, we're, we're evolving with the, the EMS relations managers that have had our dogs for a year or so. So it's petting, it's doing behaviors like putting, the, the dog will put their chin in your hand or their chin in your lap. Mm -hmm. And we're together evolving more behaviors that can elicit kind of a break. Um, and the dogs that we pick have a very good temperament for this. They don't burn out, they, they're very resilient. So they don't get depressed. They go home and rough house and play with the other dogs in the person's family. And uh, they oh. like this job. And a lot of them have a sense of who needs them the most. And they'll seek out that person in the room. And they told us the story. One of the first dogs we placed named Chanel, who's a golden lab mix. They were visiting the ER and they were at the nurse's station visiting with the nurses. And one nurse walked out of the ER 
and Chanel just stopped what she was doing, went straight to that nurse. The nurse just laid down on the floor with her for an hour. Mm. And when other people would come in, Chanel would lift her head and then she'd just go back. And the nurse, they just lost a patient. It was the anniversary of her mother's death. And her adult son had had a heart attack recently in another part mm. of the state. Oh, wow. So sometimes it just gets to be too much. And what I learned yesterday or earlier this week, one of the other gentlemen who has one of our, the EMS relations managers who has one of our dogs named Fresca, who's a yellow lab, he lives in Sutherland Springs and he was on call when they had the church shooting. All right. And he knew a lot of the people that were victims. And that was two years before he had the dog. He said after spending a day there, he was going home and there was a group of people all walking golden retrievers. And he just got out of his ambulance and said, or his truck and said, can I pet your dog? And he just laid on the road <laughs> and had five dogs crawling all over him in his uniform. And he said, it really helps. So he's the quietest of the four guys in San Antonio, but he has some really deep, interesting stories. And three yeah. of those dogs and him, uh, they deployed to El Paso the morning after the shooting there last mm. August. And they saw 2,600 first responders and community members. We had a meeting with them earlier this week on another topic, but mm -hmm. um, they said they were at the command center at the Walmart where the law enforcement was watching the closed circuit TV of what happened. And uh, after they'd been there a while, they had SWAT guys in their full gear on the floor with the dogs saying, who's a pretty girl? Who's a pretty girl? And those <laughs> guys were saying guy. that was the first time they smiled in days. So yeah. Yeah. It's, oh, wow. goosebumps. Look, I have goosebumps. I know. I'm just so like my I see that on your pale Irish skin. You've got goosebumps. <laughs> it's parts, Danish. So awesome. Danish skin. That's my Scandinavian. <laughs> He tans beautifully though, just so you know. That's just so cool. Like I am constantly impressed with like just the cool things that dogs like Can do. do that what they give. Um, well, the latest meeting, because it's exciting. It's all exciting. It's 33 years of things being exciting. I started this in 1988. Is the where uh, that gentleman had told that story. We are meeting with the sheriff's department in Bernie. They have a specific mental health officer and her job is to go in the community when it's more of a mental health call. And they want one of our facility dogs to accompany them on that. So mm -hmm. this is new territory for all of us. So we had the first meeting about that and we're gonna be discussing it. And the sheriff said, I could see us having five of those dogs. So yeah. um, that's new, but we're gonna yeah. work on figuring it out together. So the dog is safe, but the dog can also help and be a bit of a bridge from the crisis to the resolution in those situations. Wow. And they had actually had a, what they call an incident. Somebody on their staff had uh, attempted suicide like the day before. So it's, it's something that those frontline workers shield the rest of us, but it does take a toll on them. And yeah. we can expand what we do to be part of the, the serve them the way they served us. At us it's very rewarding. Yeah, it's yeah. like compassion fatigue to the extreme. Right. It's just mm -hmm. more now this year than ever. You, you see it. And uh, the other thing I learned from talking to the EMS guys is that when they're compromised, they're a danger to other members of their team also. And when oh, I researched it, there have been university studies that when somebody's uh, first responders having, you know, a, a crisis of the soul, they're not as alert and so they can endanger their team members and mm. we want them to also provide the best care for the public and the patients. So right. it's right. not just helping that one person. It's a ripple effect. Yeah. Yeah. How did you like, how did you decide to do this? Like 33 years ago, why, how did you, what was the light bulb moment or did you just sort of slowly go into it or because didn't you I, have a, a, law, a law background? Yes. I was a civil trial lawyer, so we didn't have criminal cases. We had cases where people have gotten hurt from like malfunction or medical malpractice. And this was before the internet. <laughs> and I was very good at it, but it gave me a lot of stress. It was very combative. And uh, lawyers aren't always the most fun people to be around. Yeah. Um, they don't always lead with their values. So I was looking for something else to do and just trying to have the universe point me in the right direction. And at the grocery store, there was a magazine in the rack that had something about these dogs that help people with disabilities. So I got the magazine and 
at the very end, it said some of the groups get dogs from animal shelters, and I'm actually a cat person, and uh, the cats are, as they say on the memes, they're indifferent to our distress. So I uh, went with dogs and read the article, wrote to the resources there, and started doing it a little at a time while I was still an attorney. Uh, and I did it for three years without any salary while I was still practicing law, I became an appellate, appellate court briefing attorney and uh, did some more uh, law practice. And uh, in 1991, I just left law behind me. My firm split and I thought, adios y'all and didn't go with either <laughs> side of them. I just started to do the service dogs full time. Yeah. Wow. And, and how has it changed from when you first started? Because I, I, I know that from all the early years of doing the, the Mighty Texas Dog Walk that you started from the very beginning pulling dogs out of shelters and turning them into um, therapy dogs, service dogs. And has that changed at all? Or are you still doing that? We still prior, we always want to give dogs a second chance, mm -hmm. uh, dogs that other people threw away. So we still emphasize the shelter dogs and the rescue group dogs. And that's where my heart is. In the last three years, we've supplemented that with career change dogs from Guide Dogs for the Blind, which has campuses in California and Oregon. Dogs that maybe they weren't in Ravenclaw, they should have been in Hufflepuff. So <laughs> they weren't quite the right fit for a guide dog, but they were a great fit for what we, uh, the different things that we train them for. So we do supplement that. The public's gotten a lot better in 33 years about spaying and neutering their dogs. Yes. Yep. There are a lot more breed and other rescue groups that pull a lot of dogs from shelters. Mm -hmm. We yep. love working with them too. But numerically, if we go to a shelter and there's 300 dogs, it's easier than visiting an individual foster family. Right. On a rescue group. Yeah. So we want, we know that trainers can succeed with a wide variety of dogs, but we need to give the disabled person or the EMS or the facility employee, a dog that they can succeed with, even if they're not an experienced handler. So while right. all of us love project dogs, we don't want a dog that might have issues where it, it's not comfortable in a variety of public settings. Right. So all the dogs can figure out how to do the sound alerts and retrieving and that thing, but they might be afraid of a certain kind of floor like tile, or they don't like yep. stairs and we can't get them over it or men in hats or uh, the forklift beeping when it goes backwards at Home Depot. Mm -hmm. So we really, we're not gonna force the dog in a situation where it's not comfortable. So we are continuing to really try to push rescue dogs, but we're also supplementing with the uh, career change dogs. We actually started a program this month called Project Adopt. Whenever we have a dog that doesn't complete its training from a shelter, we'll adopt it out as a pet dog. We don't send them back to shelters, but because that's been very popular, we're now looking at adopting shelter dogs directly to become pet dogs. That lets us look at a wider age range and a wider set of temperaments. So it's going to help us scoop up more, even more dogs and kind of a rising tide lifts all boats, um, get them in the pet homes and open up more spaces for more oh, dogs to be rescued. That's fantastic. Yeah. Wow. That's fantastic. That's way more that's much better than being a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. I always say I went from um, lawyers to stray dogs and it's a step up on the evolutionary matter. Yeah. <laughs> then I remember we have attorneys and we've had Supreme Court judges on our board, but they, of all um, philosophies, but they put up with me. So that's good. Aww. <laughs> well, and you, you all custom train each dog for the specific job that it's going to have. Is that correct? Yes. We train all the dogs in some fundamental behaviors. Then we have something we call matching where it might, it, it's going to be a while since the person was accepted as a client. They come back. We introduce them to multiple dogs, but we also do another lengthy interview. And once we match them with the dog, we will train that dog in whatever custom behaviors that that person wants. Like we have a gentleman now that has Parkinson's and is in a kind of a bigger home. We train his dog to go across the home and get his medical bag of supplies and bring it back. We also taught that dog to put its paw on his foot so it unfreezes him. Sometimes with Parkinson's, you're trying to walk and you freeze. But if you have pressure on your foot, it'll make that episode stop and you can resume walking wow. around. 
He mm. also uses a cane and he's a little bit off center. So we train this dog to walk with someone with an uneven gait and kind of lean on him a little bit so to, so he can steady him. So that's wow. one of the custom behaviors. We've trained dogs before for people with prosthetic legs. Mm. And sometimes they want the dog to fetch the leg. So we'll, <laughs> we'll train it to do that too. That's so, that's wow. That is really cool. <laughs> that, how, do you ever like how do you manage the influx of people looking for service animals? Like because yeah, I'm sure you get more than you can possibly help. Right now we have caught up. So we are actually eager to get more applicants. We train throughout Texas. They need to be an adult. We really prefer that when they get the dog, they don't have another dog. So the working dog can focus on them, although other types of animals are all right. And um, so we're very eager to get more clients with a loss of hearing, a loss of mobility, or from county and district attorney's offices and from other uh, first responder facilities. Mm -hmm. We uh, have someone on the waiting list that's the director of EMS relations for the Rio Grande Valley, which is McAllen and, and um, Brownsville. And they serve multiple hospitals and EM and paramedic stations. So she's next on the list, but we've rather caught up. So um, we, and how we deal, <clears throat> deal with them is we just let them know what the waiting list is. But while they're on the waiting list, we send them a monthly workbook that's got some training information and they have little homework assignments so they can be learning and, and engage with us as we go along. Do the got dogs... It. Are they staying with you the whole time, learning, like the getting the foundation for the behaviors that they need? Or does the person come in a couple of times a week or? No, they, they stay with us until they start training. So we have a six acre campus in Dripping Springs mm -hmm. outside of Austin. And we have two big kennels. They're fully air conditioned and heated. And then we have a big training building. And then we have a little house that came with the property. And so they're doing all their training there. And we also do public work because uh, the person is allowed to take the hearing or service dog with them, just like you could with a guide dog. So we're going to HEB and Home Depot once or twice a week to work on public behaviors. When the person is ready to start training with the dog, they have a five day class with us. Then we move the dog into their home and then we go train with them weekly for three months wherever they live in Texas. So we want to train with them in their home and in their community to really make sure the dog understands their refrigerator opens to the left, not to the right, like it did at the training center. And they can mm -hmm. do that. And when they're at their shopping mall and the, the security guy asks them about why they have the dog there, they're comfortable explaining the law to them or whatever it is. So we really want to set everybody up for success and we're actually making the client a trainer themselves because yeah. there there's always going to be something new and they have enough tools to be able to typically handle it themselves and we wow. learn a lot from the clients also and we'll create new behaviors based on something they created we um, now teach the dogs to help with laundry oh wow as one of the clients i need a dog that, for that um, what courtney i said i need a dog for that <laughs> Yeah, but, they can get the stuff out of the dryer and put it in the basket and then pull the basket. We attach an old necktie to the basket. We're big on old neckties and <laughs> they'll drag the basket through the house. We have video of that where, you know, it, it helps somebody who may not be able to bend over and reach to the back of the dryer to get that last sock out. Yeah. Have, yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, a, a gentleman who's a Marine now that lost a leg. Uh, he was, he's a Vietnam veteran and he, he lost his wife about a year ago. Her name was Betty. And so this dog helps him with the laundry and uh, we do, ex we did a lot, a lot of, lot, we have a washer and dryer that are just for practicing and laundry baskets. And it's interesting, this dog is a kind of a honey colored female uh, Labrador and her name is Beatrice, but they call her B. And he, at the luncheon we had after his team training that five days, he said, Everybody called my wife B, and he said, I really think my wife sent me this dog. Oh, so pretty sweet. Oh, and how much do you that. cry at your job? <laughs> I'm pretty good. I, I don't cry, uh, but um, we everybody does get teared up. Sometimes I go home and tear up a little bit later. Yeah. And um, it's pretty sentimental. This is not easy. We do all of this free of charge. So my job is to keep, keep things going and to find new ways to tell our story. But 
fundraising is, it never stops and yeah. it can be a grind and there's a lot of rejection and there's a lot of, nobody appreciates me if you let yourself do that. So when I hear about this, I'm like, oh yeah, this is why I'm doing this. So I can right. live with myself. It yeah. makes it I remember all being in a women's business group years ago and somebody said she does not want her tombstone to say she had a nice house. Right. So there are more important things in life to go. What's the meaning of life? Well, until I figure that out, I know I've helped some people and helped some animals and that helps me yeah. deal with all of what, think, what life's about. Right? Yeah, I think we don't know. <laughs> I think life, well, I think it's about helping other people. Like I, I think that's what personally, I mean, mm -hmm. that's the meaning of life is, you know, you live to, if you can help other people, you know, that's, or just do your part to make the world a better place. You know, I mean, I agree. I remember that's what we're trying to do here. That the Buddha said the self is a small thing. So if you're only yep. focused on gratifying the self, you sort of run out of, yeah. run out of room pretty quickly. So <laughs> yeah. Well, and gratifying yourself is uh, fleeting. I yeah. mean, you can whatever, buy a new car and you know, yay, I got a new car. Feels but great for a week. Yeah, maybe a little longer, but <laughs> at some point you're just like, uh, yeah, I used to wash it all the time, but you know, now I need a new car. Yeah. It just goes away. Now I'm, I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this question, but you guys don't do, um, like detection dog work, not, not drugs or bombs, but like epilepsy or diabetic seizure or things like that. Do you, do you refer that out to people or what do you do when you get calls like that? You're correct. We don't do medical alert dogs and, and they, they vary like a, a lot of medical alert dogs are working with scent, like the diabetic alert dogs are working with the way that someone's breath smells the seizure alert dogs. They still don't know how they work, but they do. We, we, uh, there are 99 organizations in the United States that are, are, are part of assistance dogs international, which is our trade organization. Mm -hmm. I'm actually the vice president of Assistance Dogs International, oh. North America. So we wow. do, we have a real strict accreditation process, which is actually very hard because it's like they do a two day inspection and then they have about 10 notebooks of stuff you fill out and submit to them about everything like fire exits and emergency plans and your arrow to the first aid kit is not big enough or red enough. So <laughs> things like that. <clears throat> but we do refer people to organizations that can serve those types of needs. We also don't train for children and we do get a lot of requests for that. And, and then we get unrealistic requests where they just are like, Hey, my grandmother's wandering out of the yard. We want the dog to like make or not do that. And sort of things that sometimes a dog will do, but it's, it's a lot to ask of a dog to do things like that. But we, always try to refer people to other sources where they can get some help. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And I heard, or I saw on your Facebook page that you actually offer, you have a training academy too for dog trainers. Is that right? Yes, that's been very popular. We started that six years ago or so. If you're already a professional dog trainer and you want to learn how to be a service dog trainer, or you're a service dog trainer and you want to improve your skills, we have a week uh, workshop. And it's unique because you're not bringing your own dog and training it. You're working with all of our advanced dogs. So you are going to get a lot of trials with a variety of dogs, which is much better for improving your skills. Mm -hmm. The way that we train is positive reinforcement based. If you want to go, how many syllables can I pile on? It's, it's positive, reinfor positive reinforcement based operant conditioning. Yes. And it just means that the consequence drives the behavior. We don't use force. We don't use punishment. We don't use metal collars or any of those aversives. Uh, yeah. And that's where I do get <laughs> profane if somebody's into that. I just usually jog by and go, shot collars suck. And <laughs> yeah. accomplish nothing. But um, yeah. Because so, uh, yeah. they do. But anyway, um, that's so funny. We're we're showing people, and they already understand that we're not at that point. If they're already saying we use balance training, like some punishment, blah blah blah, they're not even getting in the front door because yeah. that conversation happened a long time ago. Mm -hmm. yeah. But this is for people to improve their skills. It includes half a day of public work. We go trapes to the mall, and we also include a day at uh, the Austin Municipal Animal Shelter where we can all 
work on evaluating dogs and mm. uh, show them how we do that. That's fantastic. Wow. I feel like I need to do more with my life. <laughs> <laughs> we, we limit that to 24 students so everybody gets a lot of attention and then we have what we call a banquet at the local Mexican restaurant in uh, Dripping Springs which is not alcohol free so everybody <laughs> has, a, has a nice time but we've gotten a lot of feedback positive from that and a lot of people have started like programs across the country we've had a few people come in from England nice. that you may have heard of it and uh, they've we appreciate the chance to sort of be part of moving the training world forward in um, animal learning. Yeah, I'm yes. still, I am constantly amazed at how many people still will argue that a prong collar or shot collar is necessary or um, required for some behavior or some dogs. And so not true. Like we've, we've never used them like from, 25 years. I, I was lucky enough to start training right when positive training was starting. And I've had a dog my whole life and I never, I, we, we had a, a choke chain, but th that was just sort of like the uniform of the dog. Like we never walked the dog on a leash. You know, the dog just ran with me behind my bike or, um, you know, nobody ever taught me how to, you know, correct a dog on a lead. Um, so I was never exposed to that, but I, I think a lot of people were, um, and a lot of people still are. And there's companies like, I mean, you know, there's, there's companies that are pumping out dog trainers. And um, pumping out their own branded shot collars. Yeah. Get it out of Yorkie. It works. I'm like, oh my yeah. God, well, what is wrong with you? I, and it depends on how much patience we have to explain it and all of that because you can just condemn it and then you can tell them right. in a sort of kindergarten primary color way why this works and that doesn't and then you can get into the polysyllabic words where you break out all the big words right. yada 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 because it's not just throwing hot dogs at animals and no. right my pet theory is people are abusive to dogs and the same reason they are to children and sometimes women because they can get away with it and dogs yeah. are very resilient and you can be a terrible trainer and your dog will figure out your bullshit and just do what it takes to survive and mm -hmm. still come the back positive training was pioneered by the marine animal training world yep we're, we're working with orcas killer whales which now we know is like leave them alone but right at the time and we we i studied a lot with them and some of them have helped us did you know 20 years ago when an animal is big enough to hurt you, you have to really think more hard about what you're going to do to it. With right. the killer whales, like at SeaWorld, those guys, they never hurt them, but they would withhold food and they would go and say, see this bucket of fish, you're not getting any, and they would withhold it. Then they would get in the tank and that whale knew which trainer was which, and they would bang them into the side of the tank and they would pin them on the bottom. And those guys would get bruised ribs and things and literally be in the hospital thinking, what if we tried to be nice to them? And <laughs> what? So all of this is based on such a concept. Yeah, and really, it just means you don't have enough tools. This is not throwing hot dogs at dogs. It's planning the behavior where you're trying to get, coming up with the approximations or steps to get to that behavior. Realizing if the animal's not doing what you want, you're not teaching it effectively. Yeah. Right. The um. And finding a lot of ways to reinforce it and realizing there's technical information here. Reinforcing doesn't mean rewarding. Reinforcing means mathematically you're getting more of that behavior. Right. And in their case, punishment means you're getting less of the behavior. It's a mathematical right. definition. When you use aggression on any animal, you're, you get three things back you don't want that hurt the relationship. You get aggression back, which is when you see like a police dog where they they're real rough with it and they turn around and bite the handler. You also see that in teenagers or, or spouses that attack the person that's been hurting them. You get escapism, which is the animal running away. That's all those mm -hmm. tigers and elephants running through the Indian villages because they don't like being manhandled. Right. That's all the kids that run away from home. And you yeah. get learned helplessness, which is where they just zone out and let you hurt them. And I remember years ago hearing a quote from a police officer that talked talking about a Rottweiler saying, 
he just went cockroach on me where they mean they just lay on their back and zone out. And if you remember like Sybil, it, animals and people who are subjected to a lot of abuse just zone out and yeah. that's the only thing they can figure out to cope with it. None of those things are desirable. And if you're in a wheelchair and you can't use your arms and you don't want your animal only giving you behaviors to avoid being punished, there's an Abraham Maslow saying that says, there is no such thing as a well-adjusted slave. So we had a guy yeah. years ago. So true. Oh, wow. And there's no such thing as a well-adjusted slave. We had a guy years ago that was in a power chair in the middle of the woods and it tipped over and he had to let the dog off leash to go get help, which we trained it for. Now, if that dog had only been working for him because it was avoiding being punished, it might have just chosen that moment to say, free at last, motherfucker. And Bye. <laughs> but it's, okay. it's trying to get people to follow it back to him. Yeah. So, uh, it's just like your partner, if you're in law enforcement, you want them to be helping you because they want to based on your relationship. Right. right. And if you take the time to learn more about this type of training, there are things to do when things don't go right. It's not just like, I throw him hot dogs and not, and if he does something wrong, I don't know what to do. There, yeah. There's a methodology and a system to it. Yeah. It also gives you the freedom to have dogs that are creative problem solvers because the worst thing that happens in this kind of training, if they make a mistake, nothing happens. They just don't get the reinforcer. But and a lot reward. of times the trainers are the one making the mistake and it gives yeah. them a chance to really look at, oh, I realized all my hand signals look kind of the same, down and shake and <laughs> everything and stay all look like just pushing towards the dog. So mm -hmm. maybe it's you, maybe it's Maybelline. So <laughs> they always say when your dog's not doing what you want, take out a newspaper and roll it up and hit yourself over the head. Right. <laughs> yeah, I will keep a better eye on my dog. So even things like toileting indoors, maybe you're not feeding your dog on a schedule. Maybe you're yeah. not overfeeding it. Maybe you forgot to take it out. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. and this is what I heard from one of the SeaWorld trainers who also does a consulting for zoos and things like that. 99.9% .9 of the time, it's the trainer, not the animal. So if you have the humility to accept that, you're less likely to say, he's giving me a hard time. I must dominate him. Right. Right. Like, oh, I'm, I need to self-examine a little bit, but it makes you a better trainer. Right. That's when we have dogs that do heroic things because they, they are creative because they're never been punished for doing something that we didn't ask for. So they don't, they're not inhibited about that. That's yeah, great. To go back a little bit on uh, the whole, you know, like the family dog pet training or trainers that teach people to, you know, how to do a leash correction or shot collar. Or, and corrections, uh, all that stuff is euphemisms for choking your dog. Right. The Canadian military did studies and most of the dogs have tracheal damage. So if you just push on your trachea, which is, where yeah. your Adam's apple is, you're like, that's annoying. Yeah. And go ahead, Bart. I'm just like, no, no, no. Well, my, all that. my point was the, um, so they teach these people, this is how you train a dog. But most of the time, those people aren't trainers. They don't have good timing. They aren't studying the dog and they most often get frustrated. So the thing that they've been basically given permission to hurt your dog it turns into uh, frustration really quick. And so, you know, the dog pulls on a leash and they're like, well, I'm supposed to correct it, but he's still pulling. So I'll just correct it more. And so you just- Next thing you, you know, you're choking the dog out. Yeah. So it's like, that, that's been one of my, you know, soap boxes that I get up on is like, you know, you're, you're basically giving people permission to hurt their dogs yeah. in the name of training and it's just we don't allow them on the property at all so if customers show up with a prong collar on we make them take it off yeah. we always try to offer them like here we'll give you this harness or we'll give you you know we're, we're always trying to talk them into I'm, it and most customers comply we occasionally have one one guy right now who, who's and it's been a long time since i've seen him but his wife was going to cancer treatment and you know that's why they were boarding all the time because she was going to MD Anderson. And, you know, he was like, I get it, but I don't have time for that right now. Like I'm just dealing with my wife and I, I need you to just shut the fuck up. And I was like, okay, uh, you know, still can't have it here on the property, yeah. but um, you know, it, but there's so much we can't control once they leave here. Well, and we, that's what I'm 
always trying to figure out how to fix. We have figured and that out goes for electric uh, buried fencing and that kind of collar too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't. Mm -mm. No. They right. they came into my office years ago and they're like, "Can we put pamphlets?" I'm like, "No, you cannot." No, you can't. Get out of my office. Like I I figured out that you can't shame people like you know, give them a, Into behaving. so I started like just offering people. I'm like, I will buy the collar off of you and sell you one of ours. Like at cost. like, you know, let me show you how this collar works better than what you have. And it doesn't hurt your dog. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Yep. So we've both, we've all three been on the same bandwagon for a long time. I have a, a lot of patience. Um, but the world I don't think why those companies do that. I think they're just small business franchisers. They're just trying to make a buck and they don't know any better. Yeah. And yeah. People don't take the time to think about kind of the humanity of the animal, yeah. or whatever the phrase is. They're like, I'm a superior being to an animal so I can treat it however I want to get the results I want. Mm -hmm. And yeah. they do have some growing to do. And I don't know if they'll ever be enlightened, but at least the public can know, don't go to a trainer or anyone where you board where they use any kind of dominance, electricity, Corrections, Deal. which is a euphemism for choking. Yeah. Think about a child, even a, here's an example I use. Let's say you go to France and you don't speak French and you work in the bakery and they're always telling you in French what to do and you don't understand. So they just keep hitting you. You're not in the mood to learn and you kind of hate them. And that's the dog doesn't understand. And it's your job to somehow teach them in a different language what you want yeah. them to do. Mm -hmm. And you will be rewarded by the dog doing what you want them to do and having a good relationship with it. And good croissants. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how many dogs do you think you've helped? Like how many? Over the, how over many, the years, if you had How to, many pairs oh, have you made? How many what? How many pairs? Like, like how many, like how many dogs, dogs have you have gone through the programs? Well, we probably, after 30 years, or probably hitting around 1500, I guess, yeah. because even wow. the dogs that don't complete training are going to go to a pet home. Yeah. yeah. I'm not statistical. So I'll be honest. I make up those numbers because I don't really know. 90% yeah. <laughs> of the time I make it up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, That's all funny. good. That's all good. It's wow. a sentence, but you know, we started out in 88. We, we started the guide dog relationship two or three years ago. So, um, and it's I love it. one of the dogs that saves someone's, you know, we are, we'll adopt a heartworm positive dog. We, we like to adopt from places where the dog needs it the most. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, it's, it's nice. And even the places that breed dogs for this type of work, they only use a third of them. They say that's because they have high standards, which is fine, but they're creating two thirds that the community needs to absorb. Right. So mm -hmm. we can get, I like, because people are like, what breed of dog do you use? And we're very happy to use pure and mixed breed dogs because we're going by the temperament, not the wrapping paper. Right. So I say, if the dog can do the job, we don't care who your parents are. So just like. Aww. Your right. We yeah. love them all. We, we love, love them. All. You know, I still have my uh, Texas hearing and service dog shirt from the, the first dog walk, the one that was at Katz's. Mm -hmm. Is that the one where it looks like his nose looks like a missile? Um, he's got a <laughs> cowboy like hat on and yeah. maybe a bandana. Okay. It's yeah. like paper thin. Like you can see through some he's of it. He's worn it a lot. Yeah. My that, son, year, that was 1999. We're, yeah. We skipped it this year, but we're, we're doing our 21st. That one, we had it near Cass's and Mark Katz, for those of you who are new to the community, it's a, uh, a delicatessen bagel restaurant where yeah. with a very flamboyant owner and he said you didn't put our logo on the shirts and I said I didn't even put our own logo on the shirts because right. I just was slow to pick up the yeah but yeah we were all doing the best we could back then yeah, with, we with what we now. had that was the year we didn't mark the course well enough and people like went the wrong way and got lost yeah so we're better at that now. <laughs> I was just handing out bananas <laughs> yeah <laughs> y'all were uh, great Oh, you guys always said the best foods with all the hay bales and everything you oh yeah. yeah we had fun passing out fruit and then the food the food Nazis came and made us stop cutting it up. And Look, then we can't. just started giving it away whole. And that year uh, we, we were doing it three miles because our goal every year, our goal is to win a Guinness world record. And yeah. we won eight of them. Now to get longest dog walk, you had to have it be three miles. And we won that twice. And then we started doing other records. So we made it one mile. So people don't have to be 
walking yeah. this walk. Yeah. I remember the one year you had the biggest fur ball and it was this giant globe full of fur. <laughs> yes, I'm very proud of that. Um, we had the world's biggest fur ball. Uh, we did that twice. It was in a giant sort of lucite snow globe. Yeah. It was 200 and something pounds in the first year, and the second year was 315 pounds. And oh my gosh. We had a red carpet, and you, we would brush your dog and put the fur in the snow globe. And we went around town to groomers and got their fur, and they all looked confused. And I used fur from home, and I have a lot of cats, but no cheating for real. Wink, wink. So. <laughs> Simple, it's visual, and it's slightly disgusting, and yeah. that's why we're so proud of it. It yeah, was no, very memorable. Funny. Yeah, I, I I remember it fondly. So I, I've got a couple of questions for you. It's that time are for the speed round, the I think. The speed round. And I, I like how your cat's walking across. <laughs> this uh, is, um, this this is, is the dog in the witness protection program. So. <laughs> <laughs> you should see his eyes. He's like, mom. He's like, oh, my God. This is uh, Valentina Tereshkova, the first woman in space. So. Oh, nice. nice. So, you have to say every time. Did you know, Dog Boys, uh, we have a cat that's uh, our mascot? Her name no. is Callie, the Callie, Calico. Callie, the world's bravest cat. So she's like a mascot at a dog ranch. Yeah. And she knows which dogs will really kill her and the ones that are just talking. Like she can pick them out. She's like, they'll come yeah. right up to her and sniff her. And she's just like, what? And then wow. sometimes she sees a dog and she's like up a tree or I'm on gone. the fireplace. You know, she just like she has lots of escape routes and lots of elevated areas. Yeah, but most how of the time you she's just like her? bring it. How, how did, did we get her? get her? Was she on the property or something? Uh, yeah. She was. Um, no, we took in a couple of. Uh, yeah, we got two feral cats from like the feral cat rescue. Yeah. And she was a like she was feral. I mean, she like we didn't see her for. You know, she along let she would her. hide, she would hiss. Um, she was not not at all a friendly cat. And now she is, I mean, she lays on the desks and she's just like, Ugh. you know, you can put like a pin Aww. in between her cross paws and she'll she'll hold it for you know 30 minutes. And yeah, she'll she'll let us do just anything to her, but she's she outlived three very friendly males. Um, and so after the third cat, after the third male cat died on the property either being killed by a wild animal or something um they started bringing her in to sleep inside at night and yeah. then she was just out and in during the day and after the the after she became the only cat she was like all right people are okay now yeah so she's um, a yeah. Right. yeah i think she's like 10 right around 10 yeah Good. so and the customers That's love her and you, most most of them don't see her until we're like oh watch out for the cat or <laughs> is your dog okay with cats and they're like, what cat? Sometimes I see her staring at the dogs in play group and she goes, ah. meow, 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 meow. It's like she's barking. <laughs> she's like barking and meow. Language. I don't know. I love it. I love we it. have a staff cat too uh, named Tony. That's, uh, he's very confident. So it helps us uh, evaluate the dogs around cats and desensitize them. Oh, that's yeah. great. That's great. You got to have. Okay. So I've got three questions for you. They're, they're pretty easy. <laughs> she, oh, I saw you take a breath. <sighs> Okay. What is your first memory of a dog? Like, what's your first memory of like joy with dogs? Or growing up in in Dallas, we had a kind of probably a border collie mix. It was named Fluffy because nobody had any imagination, and it was <laughs> a backyard caramel colored and white dog that was again kind of a border collie looking for a dog. And I just remember thinking, gee, he's so much friendlier than the cat we have, whose name is Creature, that <laughs> somehow just was part of the family. And it, she always hid under the couch. And if you try to pet her, she'd scratch you, but I still loved her. And, but I'm really a cat person. We moved around a lot and yeah. I was more friends with the family pet than the uh, kids at school. But, yeah. um, I brought that to all animals, but that's, I guess, fluffy, but again, um, cat lady running a dog business what? it's yeah. so amazing that you're so yeah. into cats and you've done all this world of good for dogs like i just am so that's funny courtney's allergic that. she's I'm allergic. allergic to cats and dogs <laughs> but not so um, bad that i can't be around them i just oh, you know no, dogs too yeah yeah they're many crickets i mean they just mostly make like goldens and like really fluffy dogs like i'm fine like we have two razor coat dogs and they're totally fine i can you know one of them sleeps in bed with us sometimes it's no big deal um, but if it, if I get the dogs with all that extra dander, then I'm I just need to wash my hands. I just get like itchy on my face, and so. I hope they 
Can you guys tell your listeners how you came into being the, the Don Boys and the Courtney and Mark story? Because I'd be interested in that. Oh, yeah. I think, well, we've kind of told it. We, we told it on video. Yeah. But it hasn't really been a part of the podcast. Bart's told his story of kind of like why he became a positive trainer a couple times. But um, that's that's a good point. We should probably tell that story okay. soon. We'll make a special podcast just to tell the story. Who we are. <laughs> uh, we do go way back. Second question, and this might be a little skewed, but how many dogs have you had in your life? Like, any that you've owned. Have you owned any dogs other than yeah, Fluffy? I have one, or, one or two dogs. So right now I have a great Pyrenees from Pyrenees Rescue named Snowy, who's basically like a cat. She's dog aggressive. Yay. Yay. So, I have to hide behind trucks and buildings if we see other dogs. So I just take her to non-populated places at odd hours, like the strip center. Yeah. And uh, um, yeah. And, and before that, I'd had a border collie mix from the city shelter named Pearl, the Wonder Dog, after the Robert Lee Parker books that I use for demos a lot. Aww. So I like the kind of dogs that have long hair, like bearded collie mixes and things. Mm -hmm. I have a spare bedroom that's the graveyard for vacuum cleaners because <laughs> vacuum cleaner graveyard because their fur wraps around that rotating thing the yeah. brush. you smell burning rubber and you're like time to bury you yes yeah, right. sorry time, time to let go of this vacuum cleaner but Another i enjoy one. dogs a lot i don't do all those dog sports our trainers are in the agility and freestyle yeah. and dog yeah. shows and, and i don't do that but just understanding training and the back and forth my dogs end up doing pretty interesting behavior. So I yeah. that. like, um, I don't even, anyway, it's, it's fun. And it's the way that you can train is you get the behavior and then you add the cue last. Right. So, right. Um, yeah. You don't just say, sit, sit, sit. And the dog <laughs> magically does if it. If I had a dollar for every time a customer came into our lobby and they were like, sit Rover, sit, sit Rover. And I'm like, really, it's okay. He doesn't have to sit. She's like, yes, he does sit Rover. I'm just like, Oh God. It's, uh, I think people just have this need to like dominate. No, not, so, not even so much that, but it's like, they have this need they, to like show us that they're a dog good is, dog trainer, like that they, they well get behaved. their dog or that their dog is a good dog. Yeah. And we don't, you don't need to perform anything. Just drop your dog off and we'll let it have fun. Like, and then I'll not, walk up to them no and, pressure. you know, put my hand like kind of close to their face. Maybe like I've got something and then just lift it over. Like, <laughs> oh, look. Oh, so cute. Sounds like mom, are you almost done? Oh, so sweet. And I don't like dogs, yeah. but I like cats. That's what happens when I've been out of town. I come home and a couple of cats come up and then I'm like, where's Snowy? She's at the back of the house because she doesn't care. Oh, yeah. so it's like, oh, mom says no. Yeah, Good. that's great. Okay. But when you're talking about training, one of the uh, guys that taught us years and years ago would about that cue where you're saying it multiple times, he would say, never, never say it, say it twice, twice. Right. Yeah, that's funny. Never, never. I know. Never, never. Unless you so, don't want it to work and then, and then go for it. Unless you don't want it to work, work. <laughs> that's funny. Um, last question. What's your biggest like, oh no moment, like a thing that a dog did that was either very costly or just sort of like, I can't believe that just happened or like a, it could be personal or business related. We had we one person. We've never in 33 years, we, well, we're starting our 33rd year. We've never had a complaint about a dog's behavior in public. That's uh, we haven't had dogs do crazy things like destroy things or run away and go through the neighborhood. It just hasn't happened. Yeah, oh, well, that's good. More, no, at first I thought you meant something I've done because I've done plenty of stuff where I was like, oh, did I say that out loud or <laughs> whatever? But um, yeah. No, that's just, funny. No, we have a, like our son adopted a dog a year and a half ago or so, maybe almost two years ago now. Yeah. And we were telling him like, you're, you know, you're only 22 or 21. Like Don't it's really it. early to adopt a dog. Like you live in an apartment. We were just trying to discourage it, telling him how expensive it was going to be. And he was like, no, no, it's going to be great. I've rescued it. It's going to be great. It was a, like, we thought it was a Samoyed, a Samoyed mix, but it wasn't. Um, but he's a great dog, but he went out of town and he, and he had a friend coming in to check on the dog and, uh, the dog was on medication for, he was a heartworm positive, And so he was on trazodone to yeah, keep and him. prednisone, I think. 
And while he was gone out of town, he called us on Saturday night at like 1030 and was like, hey, yeah, mom, I'm not at home, but my friend who's watching my dog just said that he came in and he found both bottles of medicine open and empty on the floor. Like the dog had eaten all of the trazodone, all of the prednisone. And he was like, what should I do? I was like, go to the emergency room, <laughs> go to the ER right now. And he's like, well, shouldn't we just like wait and watch and see? And I'm like, no, your yeah. dog is going to die. <laughs> yeah. Go to the ER. And he was like, it's going to cost a lot of yeah. money. I'm like, well, well, we'll give you the money. I'll give you a cat story. Okay. Um, more, now these, for the last million years, I, I have a dog door to the backyard and now I have kind of an aviary thing. So the cats cannot get out of the backyard. Before that, Silver, the cat you just saw that gray tabby with yeah. the dog, um, he's kind of a hunter. So one <laughs> night he streaked in through the dog door and had something brown in his mouth, which I thought was maybe one of the other cats and streaked into the garage because I have a cat door into the garage because there are litters in there. So I followed him in there and it was a friggin' owl. He was, <gasps> he was hunched over at the corner like a vampire with a victim. And I was like, shit, that's an owl. So he <laughs> got it out and put it in a cat carrier and read, what do you do when you find an owl? And it said, call the owl specialist. Don't give them hamburger. Don't give them cat food. Don't give them anything. Yeah. Quit reading this and call the owl specialist. So uh, I did take the owl. The owl didn't have any injuries. And I took him to the lady who was the raptor type lady and uh they brought him back two weeks later she had like frozen mice in her freezer ew but that's what they eat they have to have calcium or their legs don't, the bones don't develop and they they get like duck legs and they they so they have they can't just have your stupid hamburger oh, right so then <laughs> well. they came and released it back because they have they mate for life so they have to go back where they were found and she looked at all the cats she said Who's who has that dirty mouth? Who's who's the naughty cat? Because <laughs> she had said I'm going to give the owl antibiotics, and I said, "Do you think it? Why? Because I don't think he has a bite." She goes, "Cats have dirty mouths." And I was oh, like, How dare you! You're but like, I started volunteering please. for Austin Wildlife Rescue, and they're a great organization. And I turned sixty last. Well, I'm sixty one and a half now, but I spent no my sixtieth birthday cleaning out possum cages with a spray nice. hose and. And um, it's very rewarding. They, they do great work, and I love them. Oh, what that's so great. He said, I, happy birthday to me while you're cleaning out the possum yeah. cage. <laughs> that's funny. Oh, yeah, it was pathetic, but um, <laughs> it was all right. Oh, that's great. Uh, I, I love it. I like them a lot. Um, well, see, that's a good story. That's a big, that's a good one. Yeah. And yeah. before that, I used to find, before I kind of secured the backyard, I would find squirrels what used to be a squirrel without a head and without legs. And I thought, mm -hmm. oh, some kids torturing squirrels. And then my veterinarian said, it's your cat. And she yeah. said, they like to eat their brains. And I was like, my little silver. Yeah. I had a boy that said, you know, if your cats are bigger than you, they would eat you, right? And I said, I don't know that. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah, our little dog Noodle, he's 13 now. He's a little chewini. And he used to love to come inside with like a headless rabbit or just the head of the rabbit. And he would put it on the children's bed and then he would sit on the pillow and, and look just like at it. guard it. <laughs> and I was like, oh, buddy, I got to take this. I'm so sorry. <laughs> the yes, rabbit head has to go. It's really disturbing. Yes, yeah, very disturbing. Is, but yeah. So that's... one last question for you, and that is, what is the best way for people to donate to Service Dogs, Inc.? I know you guys have an amazing uh, calendar coming out for next year. There it is, Dogs, Dogs and, Heart. and Hearts. Sweet. Does that yeah. have all your events? Our website is servicedogs.org. This says smiles are contagious, and it's a picture of an ER nurse and the dog, both of which have the little, what do you call that thing you wear in your hair, hair net? Oh, thing? a little hair net, hair. yeah. Yeah, uh, and this is a dog with a woman who's in the Army. She's not just in the Army. She's a major general. Wow. Nice. And the Go girl. Texas National Guard did a COVID call center. Oh, wow. And uh, that's awesome. So if you go to service dogs with an S, servicedogs.org, that's Miss May. Yay. That's, I always look at May. So beautiful. That's his birthday month. Yeah. So he'll keep that up for a long time. You can donate or you can get a uh, calendar. They're just $10. Um, I love it. Oh, cool. I love it. We'll go online and buy a couple right away. But um, we're looking Thank forward you. to uh, next year's events and uh, getting out, getting more involved. Hopefully, you know, with this vaccine coming and you know i'm hoping that 
soon we'll all be able to be together again. Yeah. Yeah. I do too. That one of the things I like about the work both of us, all of us do is that it supersedes typical societal boundaries. It doesn't matter who you voted for or what color your hair is or how much money you have. The animals give you unconditional love and we're here to help humans and animals. Yep. Be together and build build better lives together. Yes, absolutely. That's a good reminder. Thank you so much, Sherry. We really enjoyed it. I enjoyed it too. Thank you. I'm honored. Yeah. And we'll, we'll look forward to seeing you soon.